before we start to talk about this very hot topic about Myanmar after the coup, I would like to give you a short outline of what you can expect. We have four parts. In the first part, we are going to talk about the ongoing events in Myanmar. Then we are going to talk a bit more in depth about the military and its role in the country. We will cover the wider region Asia in regards of the conflict which is going on and then we have time for some questions. I would like to start actually in the center of action in Yangon with a Burmese, a young Burmese woman, Nind Piu Piu. She works for an international NGO. She cannot be with us live today, but she has sent us a pre-recorded message about how she feels about this group. As soon as we, we hear about the military coup, everyone is shocked and angry. Within the COVID situation, we voted the party we want. Also, the, this year, the election is quite uh, special, everyone, for us, because we have many uh, worry and uh, pressure and economic and also with the pandemic. And on the first day, yeah, they shut down the internet, cut off the mobile connection. So suddenly we, we don't know where to contact and we, what we have to do. Most of the, the medias like uh, broadcasting has been detained by them. And now we only have uh, two channels uh, that's announced on the media broadcasting, but people are not uh, listening anymore and not relying on that because the, all the news are fake and not correct information. And they also release uh, information on social media even though they are they ban their Facebook to use but they still announce through their social media because the majority of the Myanmar population trying to use the social media in order to get the information. So for the for the daily go to the grocery uh, buying for some food uh, still still we can do it but the the price are uh, obviously increase with this uh, political uh, situation. And, but uh, some of the, the important public service, for example, healthcare service has been stopped. The medical staff and the doctor joined the civil disobedience movement, who are the first one who starts initiated on this movement. And, and also, for example, the bank, uh, some of the major important service has been closed. Most of them are closed. And, and also, uh, as a citizen, we also try to uh, encourage on that that we want all the government staff uh, as much as possible to join on the this civil disobedience movements. We know that this is one of the powerful way to fight back on this military coup. As a citizen of Myanmar, we are trying to uh, uh, fight back uh, as much as we can on with different strategy without. Uh, any violations. But on the other hand, the military has uh, used very cruel will and used weapons uh, to threaten people. And also uh, some of the cyber spill they have just drafted that also it's also already have uh, limited on the freedom of expression. Our human rights has been taken away. And also now every night, uh, all the street what have to uh, protect ourselves because uh, the military, they arrested the civilian, especially the government staff who are involved in the civil disobe disobedience movement. As a citizen, we decided that we were never stopped until we get back uh, our uh, elected government. We will also use all the different strategy and channel that to let all the, the international people know about what's really happening in Myanmar. So we heard from him how difficult it is to inform yourself in this situation at the moment in Myanmar. Natalie, you are in Myanmar at the moment. How do you yourself inform yourself and also your employees? How, you, how do you get information? How do your employees uh, organize themselves? Yes, Ming Laba to everyone from Myanmar. I'm on site uh, in uh, in a hotel with a good Wi-Fi happily. Um, how do we inform ourselves? Well, it's a very difficult question because uh, 
on the 1st of January, when I woke up uh, at 8 a.m., the, the uh, internet was fully off, a uh, day of full blackout. Ever since, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, other social media were banned. And plus bonus, we got a full blackout from 8 p.m. till, uh, what is it? No, 8 a.m. till 9 a.m. every day. Kindly, it was announced on MRTV, on the national TV, uh, on the first day. Now it's been the third consecutive uh, day, which means for us, as a business, uh, doing a business with Europe, uh, always uh, in a time difference, we are a bit of blocked with this situation. Even worse, uh, with the cyber new cyber law, which is uh, which is being uh, ratified, uh, we will be controlled during our phone calls. So even phone calls have gone to a limit where we have to look for the good provider. So what is a good provider? The one which is not a state-owned provider. And even there, we are limited in what we are saying. So all in all, it has been very difficult to communicate during these days. The best way is to see and meet people. And that's what's happening when people are gathering every night at eight o'clock and where they're going to um, beat their drum, their pet pot at ban to uh, make to raise awareness that they want to get back their freedom and especially get back their democratically elected leader. Tonight at 8 p.m., the concert drum and bass, I call it drum and bass, will start again. And I think that's the way how people do express the communication right now. You also brought us a little video from some of your employees from Net Coffee from Yangon. Perhaps we can just play that, what it means to demonstrate now in Yangon. <laughs> So people seem defined, they seem, they seem resilient, and today we have seen the biggest demonstrations in Yangon. Tim Enderlin, Ambassador Tim Enderlin, how do we explain that? I mean, there are really strict laws now, um, there are very many difficulties, how do you explain that? And tell us a bit more about what is going on now in Yangon. Yes, uh, Karin, good afternoon to you and um, all participants here from, from Yangon. If I look at the situation right now in the last days, I think um, uh, we can see that uh, demonstrations continue. Um, protests are ongoing. Um, during the day, there was a, a short um, interruption uh, over the weekend. Um, but uh, we have seen uh, yesterday and today um, that um, actually nothing has changed. Um, people are in the streets, tens of thousands here in uh, Yangon every day. They are um, colorful, creative. Um, uh, there is always new, new ideas somehow coming up. Uh, yesterday and today was the car breakdown day with uh, cars uh, blocking uh, the roads everywhere and uh, making sure that traffic could not circulate and that people um, uh, couldn't be forced to go to work. Uh, so it's uh, support for this civil disobedience uh, movement that's also on, on its way and that gains in importance uh, here in Yangon and all over, over the country. Um, so um, if I say uh, colorful and creative, um, we and, and mostly led by a young generation, um, very dynamic and able also in social media, we should not underestimate that people are determined um, and uh, they remain determined. Um, they have experienced the last 10 years on, uh, you know, what uh, more freedom, what the democratization process could mean. And um, they have uh, raised their voice during the elections um, or on the elections 2020, making it clear they, they didn't want a, a military government back. Um, and um, they are determined um, to uh, make sure that uh, this won't happen again. So, so I think what we see right now um, is a movement that will continue. It might change uh, in the days and weeks to come. It might adapt. We don't know. 
Um, it's peaceful. We very much hope it remains peaceful from all sides. The military shows uh, quite some restraint as well, um, which is, of course, and the security forces, which is, of course, uh, positive, um, um, with some exceptions, unfortunately. But I, I talk um, in general and overall, and I think that's of utmost importance right now, that uh, things can remain peaceful um, and that uh, there is engagement in de-escalation and not any further escalations. So Tim is saying it has remained peaceful so far. Montefiore from Amnesty International, what kind of human rights violations have we seen so far? Sure, so we've seen um, human rights violations in three kind of departments, if we want to call them that. The first, and, and by the way, all of this has been referenced by Nin earlier today, so this is more putting labor labels in terms of human rights, but she, she has enlightened us all with what's happening on the ground. The first have been the over 350 de uh, detained people, many of whom are senior officials and other political figures of the party that won the elections. The human rights there clearly are violation of rights to liberty and security of one's person, not because of the arrest itself, but because of the basis of these arrests. Many are on dubious grounds, and some of the grounds are actually no grounds, so no legal basis or no clear legal basis for many of these arrests. The second is the protest uh, that uh, we've been seeing, not, not the protests themselves, but some of the response. Ambassador just mentioned that it has generally been um, peaceful with some exceptions, we are collecting mounting evidence that there, uh, in some cases, there has been a use of live ammunition against protesters. And there's one incident in particular of a woman who is now, I understand last time I checked, she uh, is now in life support. She was shot in the head, presumably by government forces. Um, and then the third area of violations that we've seen is in the communication blackouts in terms of what Kinin has mentioned in the uh, internet being shut down, telecommunications being shut down for many hours on end. The, the attacks on protesters and the communication blackouts, both of those result in a number of violations, the right to freedom of association, freedom of opinion, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, et cetera. So those are the human rights that we've seen already being uh, violated. And of course, we expect given any usual coup and specifically the coups that have taken place before in this country that there is high risk for additional human rights violations as the day go by. Michael, let's look a little bit about uh, at this crowd, which we are seeing at the moment in Myanmar. What makes this crowd different, special, compared, for example, as well, to the crowd we have seen, the demonstrators we have seen last year in Thailand? Well, there are similarities and differences, uh, Karen. And I think the, the similarities are quite interesting, but may not be that significant. I think one of the similarities, of course, is the um, involvement of very young people, um, what's commonly known as sort of Generation Z, um, who have been very effective at using social media, um, using social media platforms to communicate one another, to organize, and of course, to publicize uh, the protests. Um, the other similarity is that these are groups of people who connect quite well with similar groups, uh, like-minded groups across the region. So for instance, in, you know, there'd been the three finger salute that they've used in Myanmar was very much uh, something developed in Bangkok. In fact, offered from Bangkok as a sort of a variation on the two fingered salute that the protesters were using there. And I think the third area of similarity is in some of the technological means that people are using to overcome the shutdowns in the internet by using uh, Bluetooth technology on mobile phones, which was first pioneered in the protests in Hong Kong uh, two years ago. So I think that those are the similarities. The difference is that Myanmar is a country that has emerged uh, from a, a decade long experiment in democ democratic transition, which is relatively recent. And you haven't got the buildup in sort of middle class complacency that you have in a country like Thailand, where people get tired of protesting um, and go home after a while. And there's a great deal of uh, outrage and concern in Myanmar at what has been taken away. So I would say there's much more anger than there is in Thailand. Um, and I think that's what's sustaining the large numbers in the street and making it difficult for um, the army in particular to bank on a restraint, uh, a sort of non use of non-lethal force 
and, and to hope that these people will simply dissipate. It worked in Thailand to some extent. People just went home at eight o'clock and came, came back on the weekends. Uh, so far, we haven't seen that kind of degree of complacency set in yet. And what we have seen in Thailand is also that it was much more like just a younger crowd. But I think what we see in Myanmar now today is like everyone is joining that movement. Tim, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on that, that who is joining this movement at the moment? You know, there are basically two movements um, linked together, of course. One is uh, the movement in the streets uh, all over the country, and of course, in particular in the big cities like uh, Yangon, Naypyidaw, and Mandalay. And there is this uh, civil disobedience movement that's um, uh, getting uh, bigger and bigger, uh, where uh, many people, and in particular uh, civil uh, servants, um, take part from, from all different ages. In the streets, I would say, um, um, it's very much the young people, the, as we heard, the Generation Z, the people between 20 and uh, 30. There is elder people as well. What I think interesting is that um, from all we hear that, you know, parents may not themselves want to go or not anymore. They had uh, their fights already, um, if I may put it like this, but they encourage the children to do that. And um, it's the young generation that's really leading um, I think um, um, on 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 these uh, demonstrations, that's uh, very able in using uh, social media, but very much supported by um, uh, uh, all um, uh, society uh, sectors here in Myanmar. Natalie, you work with a lot of young people in Myanmar. We heard about the rage people feel. What do they tell you? So indeed, uh, we are working uh, with over 300 producers uh, aged uh, between 20 and 30 years old. And uh, that shows actually that even producers in rural areas are going into the street, they are forming groups together, and their claim is very simple. We want back our freedom, we want back our democratically elected leader. They want their democratically elected leaders back. The first free and fair elections are just five years back in 2015. In 2011, the country started opening up. I wonder how much power did the military still have now under the civilian government? Tim, perhaps you can shed a bit light on that. Yeah, I think first um, we have to be aware that the constitution of 2008 um, that's still enforced has been drafted under the then military regime. And it has been drafted in a way that the military um, uh, had its influence um, the way it wanted to have in uh, constitutional affairs and in politics. Um, to give you just uh, two figures, um, and I think many people know that in parliament, 25% uh, of the people uh, of the of the of the of, of the um, representatives were actually from the military appointed by the commander in chief and not elected um, uh, by uh, the people by the population. 25%, which is uh, the veto uh, that you need to block any constitutional change. And then uh, three key ministries: uh, the Ministry of Defense, of Home Affairs, and of Border Affairs were also. Um, in the hand of, um, of the military, where the military could appoint its uh, uh, ministers. Um, and maybe uh, lastly, um, one of the vice ministers, there was is a president, sorry, there is one president under the constitution of 2008 and two vice presidents. And one of the vice, vice presidents, even though it uh, was uh, uh, politically not that important a figure, but um, uh, always was also uh, from the military. So the military for sure, um, um, had an important role and kept its important role with the constitution of 2008 and limiting thus um, also um, uh, the, the, the options and possibilities of the civilian government. So still a lot of influence by the military in Burma, in Myanmar. Michael, tell us a bit more about how is this military, the Burmese army, the Tatmadaw, how are they different from other militaries in the region? Well, I think uh, two main differences. Um, one, the military in Myanmar has much more resistance to isolation or tolerance of isolation, which makes it very difficult 
um, to impose things like sanctions or even you know, what we've seen with the move from the International Court of Justice or even the threat of prosecution by the International Criminal Court, they're sort of impervious to um, outside um, uh, influence. And I think one of the reasons that's not sort of often noticed is that one of the reasons for this is that if you talk to senior military people in Myanmar, they will always tell you about the challenge they face being caught between India and China. And this challenge of being sandwiched between these two big powers has actually made them extremely resilient. And I think the other reason, of course, is that for economic means, the military can always rely on this huge underground, what I like to call conflict economy of illicit narcotics, of jade, of, of that, that generates billions of dollars in revenue every year, which they take a sizable cut in. Uh, but unlike, but, but like other militaries in Thailand and historically in the Philippines, there is this sense that, that they feel that the military acts as, and Indonesia, of course, a long time ago, that the military serves as the guardian of the state. And, and this has periodically in, the, in some of these countries, but relentlessly in Myanmar, resulted in their, in their insistence on, on maintaining a stranglehold on political power. It's also a military which has been involved in active combat for 70 years in some parts. Uh, there are different armed ethnic groups they're fighting. We have the Rohingya crisis in 2017. How much are the generals, and especially Ning Ong Leng, the army chief who made the coup, actually is responsible for the coup, how much are they involved in human rights violations? Perhaps this is a good question for Monse. Yeah, so Amnesty has reported extensively on exactly this question, and not only um, Min Ang Lang, but, um, but military combat units and other individuals who are now actually in power and who were before the coup, uh, in, not formally in power, but certainly in very powerful positions. So the role is quite significant, as we have reported, that um, General Min Ang Lang and a number of other uh, commanders up and uh, of the military forces have been directly involved in 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 many of the violations. You said the Rohingya crisis, but it's important to note, as you also said, that we're looking at violations of international humanitarian law and human rights violations across the board, not only in the specific context of the Rohingya crisis, which was obviously well documented by the media, but you know, in Rakhine, Kashin, and northern Shan states, starting as uh, earlier than 2016, but especially in 2016 and 2017. So those um, violations and the role played by, uh, by a number of high level officials has been reported extensively, which is problematic, of course, uh, especially because they are now in power, but because of their links to a lot of military businesses that they have been uh, directly profiting from. We will talk in a, in a short while about these military businesses, but Tim, what I would like to know from you, I mean, as representative of the Swiss government, how are you dealing now with such a government? Or what does this mean also for Swiss development work in Myanmar? How can you deal with them? Switzerland has one of its largest bilateral programs on development here in Myanmar, actually. Um, uh, we started in 2012 and uh, built it up very quickly um, and working in different areas, working also in the, in the peace process here. Um, we are right now um, together with other uh, uh, development partners and donors in the process of analyzing uh, the situation in terms of what does that actually mean for our programs. And I think the basic question is, you know, how um, or when we engage here in Myanmar, we engage for the people here, we engage for the population, we engage for the most vulnerable in, in Myanmar. And this is basically a work we want to continue. And I think that's um, so far what uh, the international community thinks at large here. So how can we ensure that um, is the question without um, um, uh, giving legitimacy to the, to the military regime or uh, without having our uh, uh, resources uh, profiting them. That's, I think, the question we have uh, uh, to solve right now, which uh, sounds simple, but in fact is, is quite uh, complicated um, and not so uh, not so easy to deal with. So um, it, it needs a proper analysis, um, uh, which we do, and I think it also needs a, a well-coordinated approach by uh, 
the international community. What we do not have as Switzerland, as we never had here um, any direct budgetary or sectorial uh, budgetary support uh, to the government. So no, no direct funding as such uh, to the government. Natalie, you are also, you're doing business in Myanmar. You came to Myanmar in 2015 with your coffee startup. How does this go and what has changed now impact your business and all the lives of the people you work with? In fact, uh, we are working here for the long term meaning that uh, if we are leaving now, we will lose a lot of producers, coffee suppliers, and we would have to build up again. I'm looking for a middle way to keep on hold my staff. Uh, they will engage in CDM, in the civil disobedience movement. They will engage in the street. But once upon a time, I guess they will be back. And I will try from Switzerland, I'm flying back uh, next week, I'm trying to keep uh, my management ongoing, uh, just in order to ensure that business ties are continuing. We've never been working with the government, we are working hand in hand with the suppliers in a direct trade relationship. And that won't change. Uh, in contrary, I will enhance direct trade in the future and hope uh, fully enlarge my, my business network with the producers. But what does it mean now, like really concrete logistically, right? Uh, the cof coffee harvest is now in March. Um, can you bring out your coffee? Yes, indeed, Karin. Uh, highways are blocked. Uh, that means uh, many stations We've seen checkpoints. Uh, previously, there were COVID-19 checkpoints where we had to show our COVID PCR test. Now we have to deal with soldiers. As a foreigner, as a foreign business person, it is sometimes a bit uncomfortable, if I may say so, because uh, in contrast to uh, the past, we now also have to pay to get uh, further on the way. Uh, in other words, to bribe, to, to get the smooth way. Um, that's just for personal. But what about the goods? Might they go from A to B or will they be stuck, even confiscated? It's not clear. So for the time being, we keep our coffees at the warehouse. And once we know better about the situation on the ground, uh, about logistics, we will consider to ship and export again. So business is affected at the moment after the coup. Let's look a little bit about at the business links of the army. Monse, you wrote a report, uh, especially about the army and one of their biggest cooperation they have. Can you tell us a bit more about the army links to business, to corporations? Uh, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in most countries, what we see is that the military is funded by the budget, the government budget that is approved by parliament or, or, an, or an equivalent uh, state body. That was true up until the coup as well. However, in addition to that, something that is extremely unique, in, in, and I'll say what is unique about it, that uh, the military, and when I say the military, I mean individuals such as uh, General Minang Lang, but many other people as well, have direct business interests in companies. What does that mean in practice? It means that, for example, there are two very large business conglomerates in Myanmar, the MEHL and MEC. In both cases, there are companies that are massive with over a hundred different companies that they own directly or indirectly or, or in full that are in all kinds of business sectors from mining to banking to, to manufacturing, et cetera. Those companies that are mm, Myanmar companies partner with foreign companies and with local companies. All of that generates significant profit. And that profit then goes up to its shareholders. What we did in a report that was released in September of 2020 was provide the first time details on exactly who is behind MEHL. We keep talking about the military, MEHL, similar to MEC, although the report focused on MEHL. Everyone says uh, behind these business conglomerates are the military, but what does that actually mean? So what we did is we uh, were able to publish a leaked document that came from MEHL issued by MEHL that showed actually, and this is the very unique part, that not only are individuals shareholders who receive uh, dividends like they would in any other company, 
those being individuals uh, high up in the military and now in power, but also military units. So actually combat battalions that are fighting in the front lines of different conflicts within Myanmar, those are actual shareholders, which is extremely rare and um, problematic. The, the reason why it's problematic for a number of reasons, but the main one is that there was and continues now especially to be no civilian oversight over these business enterprises. Of course, there should be oversight from regulatory bodies, but in practice, MEHL and MEC, these two large business conglomerates, did not have to follow many of the rules and were not as transparent as they should have been. In other words, allowing therefore profits to be generated significantly, then going to the pockets of individuals and also uh, military units that we assume uh, or presume that were being used for operations. So that's what the report did. And in terms of international businesses, there were a number of very important international businesses that were in direct partnership with these business conglomerates. Many of you will have heard of Kieran, the beer manufacturer. They have just announced you know, a week ago, po post-coup, that they are finally going to cut ties with MEHL because of these problematic links. But there are still many Korean, Chinese, and other companies that are operating directly with uh, MEHL, and therefore dividends uh, getting indirectly sent to individual uh, shareholders and these military combat units. And how have other foreign shareholders and, and business partners reacted so far now to the coup? Kieran, I think, is the best example because it is the most uh, well-known company in terms of its consumer base. It isn't the largest one, but it is uh, uh, the most uh, well-known. Uh, and and it, it, it manages two beers that I'm sure those living in Myanmar have drunk, Mandalay beer and, and Myanmar beer. But there are other companies, and, and I'd say Kieran has had the the most responsive um, response by actually acknowledging that their business partnership is problematic and then post coup deciding that that operations were no longer feasible for them. However, every other company that we've been um, targeting, they have made statements surely, including POSCO, which is one of the largest steel makers in the world and other companies, Wambao China, uh, Wambao Mining, sorry, it's a mining company that is owned by Norinco, which is a large state-owned Chinese enterprise. They have made either no comments or comments that have just uh, justified their continued partnership. And I'm speaking specifically about companies that are in direct business partnerships, where again, they are profit sharing uh, partnerships. There are, of course, then a lot of other companies that are in indirect partnership. For example, leasing uh, land that was uh, owned or is owned by MEHL. Those companies are, I believe, now assessing what they need to do next. So we have seen like here in the Japanese um, company leaving Myanmar. What should be the right response now to this coup to exert pressure on this government, on this uh, junta? Michael, can you elaborate on that? I think many of us who've been longtime observers of Myanmar and, and in the region are very skeptical about the value or the impact of sanctions, even targeted sanctions. Um, broader sanctions, of course, would, would greatly harm, you know, the majority of Myanmar people who, of course, during this recent period of the COVID pandemic, many of whom have been thrust even deeper into poverty and, and suffering because of the economic downturn. So I think it's very important um, to avoid uh, broader sanctions or further isolation of the country if, that, uh, if that's possible. Um, obviously, targeted sanctions come from a normative instinct, on the, particularly with the US, um, who feel there has to be something done. Um, but I think that you know, what we've seen is a long history of countries that believe that, that engagement has to continue um, and engagement must involve dialogue and engagement must involve not isolating, not increasing the isolation or enhancing the isolation um, that the military in particular derives a certain amount of benefit from. So I think it's very, very important to stay engaged, to stay, you know, to be promoting dialogue, um, to be helping uh, the people of Myanmar survive the current economic situation, um, but at the same time, to keep messaging the military on the need to return um, to elected government. Monte, on the issue of sanctions, what's the state of Amnesty International? What would be 
a right response now to such a coup? Yeah, it's a tricky question. Amnesty does not actually have a position on sanctions precisely for what Michael has just uh, raised. Sanctions, especially even targeted sanctions, but especially non-targeted sanctions can have a massive detrimental effect on a community at large and, and the economy. So we don't have a position on sanctions. I, I can just say that, that sanctions, if they are meant to work, um, they need to be, sanctions or any leverage exerted cannot be unilateral. Uh, I believe that there are a number of countries surrounding Myanmar uh, geographically that have much more leverage, and I'm not talking about sanctions, but more about diplomatic and, and economic leverage that can be exercised and does not appear to be being exercised at the moment. So yeah, I would say using that leverage, both in the economic, but also in the diplomatic is what we would like to see. You mentioned the uh, diplomatic. We have a diplomat here, Tim. What is the Swiss government doing regarding responding to this coup? And what do you also see from your colleagues in Yangon from different nations? Yeah, I think I can particularly speak for Switzerland. Now, when also I say that um, we have, as many others, we have reacted um, to the seizure of power by the military. We have uh, issued a statement. Um, we have uh, joined a statement uh, of uh, several ambassadors uh, here in Myanmar very recently, uh, calling also for uh, uh, non-violence, uh, calling for the release of all uh, detained uh, people, etc. We have um, supported as co-sponsors the resolution brought in by uh, EU and UK to the Human Rights Council and also had, had a statement there. So I think these are the immediate uh, reactions uh, we can have and uh, where we can show um, to, um, uh, to Myanmar, um, also to the military government that we actually support uh, the democratic process and that we urge also uh, people to get back uh, to a dialogue a process. I can very much echo, I think, was what Michael has said and uh, uh, also on, on sanctions, you know, it's, uh, there is a history here on, on sanctions in, in Myanmar and um, unfortunately sanctions often do more harm than they um, help in anything. So um, I think the international community needs to find the right answer um, and um, that's what, what we are working on. But I think as a country, a country like Switzerland, what we engage in and where we should, in my view, at least engage in is also to see um, uh, where is a need? Where is there a need for a bridge build for somebody who can foster dialogue, who can um, act, and maybe not, you know, in the immediate term, but uh, but uh, midterm at least, um, act in a sense of offering platforms of of uh, helping to find constructive solutions at the very end to help finding a, a political solution to this uh, uh, most recent crisis in Myanmar. Many say that as long as China is not pressuring the generals more, nothing is going to change. Michael, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on the role of China in region and regards to Myanmar and what they're doing, what they should be doing, which role they have. The first thing that needs to be said is that there's been a tremendous amount of anger expressed towards China on the streets of cities in Myanmar, um, which is largely based on um, a, a very widespread perception um, of China's um, support, supposed support for the military regime, in particular, helping the regime to um, restrict internet access. Having said that, I think it is a perception. Um, there's very little evidence of this at the moment. What there is evidence of is a great deal of consternation um, in China um, about what has happened, which has upset a very, um, prosperous and profitable relationship between China and the NLD-led government. Uh, just before the coup, um, we actually convened a dialogue between Myanmar and China in Yangon uh, on a virtual platform. And it was clear that many of the Chinese scholars and experts were very anxious about the, the downturn in civil military relations. And they saw this as a harbinger of trouble to come. Um, and I think that, that shows that there's a great deal of concern about instability but not necessarily a desire to interfere. Um, there is a report at the moment of a senior Chinese official who may or may not be in Maypador. That wouldn't be surprising. I mean, other officials are also trying to get in from other countries to meet with um, the military, um, including from ASEAN countries. Um, so I think that China wants uh, a restoration of stability 
Uh, it wants to get back to what it considers to be important uh, infrastructure projects and investments in Myanmar that are helping to make that important strategic border um, a useful one for China, both in terms of trade and access. And do you feel that they would be ready to bring back the civilian government for that? Because they, they had a very tricky relationship with the military anyway, right? Yes, I mean, the military is not their friend. Um, and um, Aung San Suu Kyi was, turned out, quite a good friend of China. Um, and so, I mean, it's a crude way of looking at it. And I think both, I mean, many people have commented that, in fact, China had more to lose from the military taking power than, say, India did. You know, India has a close relationship with the military, and the military looks after the, the border with northeastern India and preventing the insurgents from crossing back over the border. Um, and so India had more to gain from the military's continued role uh, than China did. What kind of risks, what kind of impact, perhaps, Michael, you can just continue, do you see after this coup for the entire, the wider region for Asia? Once again, it's a very important inflection point for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations to be seen to be doing something uh, constructive and effective. Um, I do think, and I, I won't dwell on it for very long, I think there is a much better chance for ASEAN to play a role in Myanmar because we've seen over the last almost you know, uh, 20 year, 15, 20 years, uh, uh, or certainly since 2008, ASEAN has played a role in Myanmar to a much greater degree than it has in other member state countries. So you had Cyclone Nargis and the whole ASEAN relief team that went in there. Also, more recently, with the, re the planned repatriation of Rohingya refugees, ASEAN has received a mandate to actually assist in that if and when it, it, it actually happens. So I don't think it's beyond the bounds of possibility that ASEAN can have a role in, for instance, preparing for fresh elections, uh, supporting the elections in terms of observer, giving it credibility, I don't think it's 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 beyond um, a reasonable uh, assumption that this could happen. Tim, what do you think will be the most likely outcome now in the next few weeks? What do you expect, and what are your fears as well? Oh, if I would know that, Karin, actually I don't, um, and I don't think anyone anyone does. Um, there are different scenarios possible. Of course, it's possible that uh, it continues the way it actually is right now with the peaceful protests um, and uh, rather uh, 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 security forces that, uh, that uh, restrain themselves. Um, there is still a possibility of, uh, of, of escalation, of course. Um, we do not know exactly you know, what the next steps are. I mean, the, the military government has said that it wants um, uh, to to work on on continuity. That's uh, that's what they say from the very beginning. They have uh, the, the fight against the pandemic as a priority. They have the economic development um, as a, as a priority. The peace process is is for them a priority as well. Um, we just do not know in uh, what terms will they be able also to deliver on that now, especially also as there is so much uh, opposition right now. So uh, I don't think it's it's really predictable what can um, uh, happen here. But as I said uh, at the beginning, um, and, and what we all should maybe uh, uh, be aware of and, and work for is um, that um, this does not turn into uh, something more violent um, and uh, that bloodshed um, uh, will not happen um, and uh, that uh, eventually we will uh, or that the parties will find ways to start communicating with one um, of the other. I would like to move on to some of the questions which are coming in here. There is one question which someone which is who is asking if um, did the civilian government by not publicly condemning the military for its treatment of the Rohingya crisis lose its soft power to a degree that will now cause a weakening of the international response to the coup? I think that it's, it's really, to conflate the past problems with the current problems is of course, you know, to make it all much more complicated. Um, clearly, um, Dong San Suu Kyi didn't bathe herself in glory um, in terms of the response to the Rohingya crisis. Um, which was in itself perpetrated by the army. Um, and then she ended up defending the army's actions uh, at the International Court of Justice. Um, I will say that I think that the military regime will do its best to, to try and uh, address those issues. 
if anything, to sort of show up the previous government's inability to do so, and also to curry some favor with the international community, who of course want to see the repatriation of Rohingya refugees. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit bizarre because you have an issue that the international com community criticized the previous government for that the military government may try to address because in particular it wants a better relationship with Bangladesh. Um, and then the international community will be forced to sort of say, oh, that was a good thing that these refugees returned. Um, so it's going to be enormously complicated. So one person is saying that they still can do business in Shan state, that their uh, farmers are still continuing farming. And another person is asking how safe it is to conduct business in Myanmar. Um, the person is saying we were dealing with a government entity, what safeguards should we deploy? I think Natalie can answer that question. How safe is it, is it to do business? Perhaps Tim can also say a few words about that later on. Yes, well, I think it depends where in Myanmar we are. There are a lot of different ethnic groups. We haven't spoken about this subject today. It would be extremely passioning uh, to touch maybe in another uh, webinar. In fact, uh, there are some ethnic groups which are supplying coffee to us and of course other commodities as well. Uh, they are in a, um, a, in a region or yes, in a region where it is quite remote and that uh, fact makes it difficult to have transparent information about the situation on the ground. I give one example, uh, Mong Mao in Northern Shan State, uh, uh, two hours from the Chinese border, uh, supplying a lot of different uh, raw material, including coffee, uh, has been fully isolated. We haven't got any information. All I know is that the Wa Army um, has uh, received uh, Chinese support. Um, so it might look that there will be a concern in the future that ethnic groups will be armed and more supported and that business doing in different ethnic areas will be more difficult in the future. Tim, would you like to answer as well? Would you like to take the question? Um, very briefly, maybe, you know, it's, it's not easy right now uh, or already now to say what, what does that mean for business here? Um, it's probably too early, but in general, I would just say, uh, and we heard that before, uh, Myanmar is a, is a very complex uh, country, um, a very difficult country as well. Um, and uh, the developments we have now witnessed and seen since uh, February 1st are certainly not contributing to a conducive uh, business environment. There's one question about the ethnical conflicts in the country. We didn't even touch really on these many different conflicts and on the peace process. The question is how powerful are the various regional ethnic armed movements within Myanmar at this time? And I would like to add and ask, what are their responses actually to the military coup? Who can take that? Um, I'll start off and just say that obviously, you know, the ethnic armed groups and the ethnic organizations are key to the future at the moment. In particular, of course, it's important to note that the Shan National um, uh, Party, the SNLD, actually won the highest number of votes after the NLD in the last elections. So they're actually critical. Um, and I think the ethnic armed groups um, have a great deal of leverage at the moment, because in any scenario, whether it's the continuation of a military junta or the military deciding to um, hold fresh elections, the military, uh, the, the ethnic groups and their political parties will be key to the success of that um, enterprise. And of course, the, the ethnic armed groups were not very happy um, with the NLD-led government. Um, there was a, a, a poor effort to reach out after the elections in November to, as they put it, share power um, and give more seat or give more appointments to ethnic leaders. But it was so badly handled by Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD that that initiative fell apart. And so in many ways, many of the ethnic organizations are sort of hoping for a fresh start on the peace process, but also hoping to gain politically um, you know, from the current situation. Thank you very much. We have three more minutes left before we end this. So I would like to that every of the all of the panelists can just say like two, three words about what they think is going to happen now, what they hope for the country. 
kind of recommend recommendations they have just a few final words monte can you start yeah absolutely maybe maybe i'll start also by uh, talk, talking about the business angle um, and, and maybe a little bit in response to a question that was asked before. One uh -huh. thing that has happened is that prior to the coup, there are a lot of ministries that were controlled by the civilian government and now everything is controlled by the military, which means that those um, international businesses that are operating with SOEs, so state-owned enterprises, that before there was no problem um, now has become a high risk. So I guess I would close by saying, absolutely companies should continue to operate in Myanmar to the extent that it's safe for them and, and for their staff, of course. But, uh, but we do want to warn that, that relationships have changed and that as such, it is really important for all companies to reassess their human rights impact in their business partnerships and their operations. And yeah, and hopefully, Hopefully that assessment will, will ensure that all companies are um, in compliance with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. Natalie. I'm a positive person. I'm hoping that the civil and obedience movement will grow bigger. We've seen an estimated 70% of government staff joining the movement. If there are even more, it will paralyze the, the country. We've seen now the Railway Association already uh, stopping their work. Uh, electricity department of the government announced that they will continue supplying electricity, even though people might not pay for the taxes for the new government. So there are different associations with different approach, but in the end, all what matters, I think, and I'm very optimistic that this is gonna happen, the power of the people, industry, their claim for freedom. And I hope that uh, this will prevent any uh, further um, inclination of, of uh, violence in on the ground. Michael? I think that we have to be very careful about the um, assumption that this use of non-lethal force and restraint is necessarily <laughs> going to last. I mean, we should remember that in 2000, uh, in 1988, there were several months of protests before the army went into the streets to mow down civilians. I mean, the protests began in March 1988, and, and in August, the shooting started. So we have a long time to go before we can really predict um, how this is going to turn out. The final word goes to Yangon, to Ambassador Tim Enderlin. Maybe two things. Um, Myanmar has experienced the last 10 years um, uh, democratic transition process, um, which uh, of course was uh, quite fragile also due to the political setup uh, here in the country. And I think it's important that this uh, democratic uh, process um, and transition process can resume, um, knowing also that this is a difficult path and it's a path that needs um, a lot of patience and it's a path also and we have seen that already that is also marked by setbacks. Um, the same goes for the peace process. We haven't talked about it today much. Um, again, in a very complex and difficult uh, context, um, also the peace process needs to go on. Uh, what this country needs after 70 years of conflict actually is peace, um, peace uh, for development then. Um, and also here, um, of course, we have to be aware of that um, after so many years of uh, conflict with so many different actors uh, playing herein, um, this is also a complex endeavor and also something that needs uh, a patient and that's rather a generational uh, question than a, a short term question. So um, I think it's important that those two processes can actually resume uh, or continue. Thank you very much for these final words. And thanks to all the panelists, Natalie, Michael, Monse, Tim. Thanks for watching this webinar and have a good day.